We are the Ashleys, and we've got just a couple ideas and thoughts. These are not really well thought out thoughts on vulnerability. Um, and we're going to be vulnerable. We're going to try to model vulnerability the whole time. <laughs> and so, yeah. Yeah. We did practice. All right. Okay, I just wanted to introduce <coughs> us first. Uh -huh. This is David Ashby. Some of you may or may not know him. He works in the home office doing some kind of online instruction, something. I always <laughs> forget his job title. Uh, Dave got his bachelor's degree in Spanish education and then went on to get his master's degree in educational technology from the United States. We've been here in Rexburg for Three and a half years or so. He is cold here. <laughs> okay. As you can see, Dave's easy on the eyes, so that was a good choice for me. He's <laughs> always uh, going to the gym and keeping up with the things that he's not done. The best thing about Dave, lately for me, is that he's very supportive <coughs> of me. So when I became an online teacher three years ago, I was because I felt very intimidated by all of you. Because I do not have an education background, I only have a bachelor's degree, and I had never taught in high school or in college or anywhere else. I just was just a mom, right? And so I felt very embarrassed. What he did for me was teach me to be myself, and that authenticity and vulnerability to my students would be worth maybe something that I didn't have. And that was okay. And this is my wife, Christine, and she was a swimmer in college. Okay, so she's got those swimmer arms and shoulders. I'm still trying to match up to those. Um, she, she has a master's degree in health science. Uh, she is mother of four, and she's a runner and now a triathlete. She's been doing triathlons for a few years, and she just got me to sign up for my first triathlon, which is in five weeks. So if some of you guys were on the temple, who was doing temple to temple relay? So some of you, that's why I was doing so much, is because she's kind of working in the shape. I'm just trying to help with her. Um, so yeah, that's us. This is our family. We like to be goofy, even when we're in church, apparently. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so let's talk <coughs> about... Our topic for today, which is not Island Parade, I just thought uh, this meme was really fun. So. <laughs> Come on. Okay. I thought it was really funny. For real. That was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for real. Okay, for real. Okay, for real. Let me ask you what are the first three instructor standards? Shut them up. Yes. Yes. And one more. Inspire love for We do them on the weekly reflection every week, you guys. Inspire love for There it is. Developer of students. Okay, that was important. Here they are. There's the answer. Okay, so we're going to focus on these three today. Okay. So, one thing that's really interesting is every week we do these, these weekly reflections, right? And we focus on these instructor standards many times. I think what we do as instructors is we look at them one at a time, right? We always ask ourselves, what did I do to build faith in Jesus Christ? And so what do you think about when you look at that? What do you ask yourself? Anybody? Did I make a discussion board post that had a spiritual topic? Did I put something spiritual in there, right? Anything else you guys think? Is that pretty much it? Did I bear my testimony, right? Um, what if I told you I think we're doing it all wrong? We look at these standards all wrong. Today, I want to break up these standards by the first three and the last two. We went to a, a presentation a couple weeks ago, and I just I had an epiphany about how these standards work. And somebody shared after that same presentation, they said, the first three are for our students. The bottom two are for us. And let's focus on the first three. No, 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 no. Oh, wait. Let me do this next one. I forgot. <laughs> is it you or me? You. Okay. Um, so the point is, which of these first three is most important? What do you guys think? I feel like you can't really separate those. Like, I, like, 
I used to do that more when I did my own class, but now I was going to teach you how when I evaluate other people's classes, like you just it, it somehow it struck me how muddy it is because I feel like by building faith in Jesus Christ, one of the biggest things you can do is treat <coughs> in a Christ-like way, which is developing relationships. And then once, so I feel like it's really hard to pull them out. Like you can't develop a relationship and like not you know build faith in Christ forever. All right, you just took the whole presentation and I can go out <laughs> That is exactly what I'm talking about. So a couple weeks ago, we had a speaker at BYU, Idaho, uh, from BYU. Alan Wilkins was here, right? And he shared, he's, what does he write? It's Faith and Learning at BYU. Yeah, the faculty. Yeah, the faculty center, right? Um, he does a study every, and he's been doing it for many years, where they send out this survey to students in courses. And they find out what students think teachers do that is spiritually strengthening and intellectually enlarging. And I really wish this was big enough for everyone to see. I didn't realize the projector was going to be this small. So I'm going to read them from the top to the bottom so those of you in the back can see these. Um, and, and let me just give you a little background information before I do that. Uh, anything, so anything in blue here is extremely important. Green is important. Yellow is slightly important, and anything, and that's at 4.0, anything 4.0 and below was either neutral or not important, okay? So from the top, we have showing they believe in students' potential. That's what students cited the most. Next was being authentic and genuine. Number three was being a role model of the living gospel. Next was helping students Deal with professional ethical issues people of faith might encounter. Next was mentioning gospel connections and insights where it flows naturally. Down in here in green, we start getting to feeling and expressing concern and empathy for students. Having rigorous intellectual standards. Taking on controversial subjects in, the, in their field with the gospel perspective. Sharing personal experiences and reconciling differences between their faith and intellect. Bring person, sorry, being personal and sharing personal experiences. Praying in the classroom. Explicitly sharing their testimony on occasion. Being open to deviations from the, from the lesson plan to address gospel topics or questions from students. Continuing honest attempts at bringing the gospel, even if awkward at times. And finally down here was sharing spiritual thoughts, devotional scriptures or hymns. What's most surprising to you about that? The thing we've been looking at when we do our weekly reflection of sorry, faith is the last thing on the list. Yes, perhaps. Well, number one thing that's most important is not really like necessarily a school related. It's not, you know, I think a spiritual thought. I mean, just like a new discussion of the time and it's building a student. Yeah. Well, that number one thing happens through an email or a phone call that we don't report on. That's a great point. And I don't know if it's just me or the, but really it's the whole conference, but the conference for me has really hit on that exact thing. And, and just like this morning, how we sat in the, um, in the chapel and talked about that email that uh, he had received from a student and what a difference it made for him and his teaching. Anyway, it's just with the little um, things and showing, and the fact that so many students don't even finish college or start because they don't believe they can, it's super important. Yeah, a few more, let's go back here. To me, so <coughs> the most important thing is acting like the Savior, not telling them what the Savior said, but but showing. Be an example. Yeah. Yeah, great. I think the, the number two one there, the being authentic and genuine, plays into that and it also plays into students whether they say it or not they really want a connection and know you as a person and that relationship I think adds to the first one knowing that you believe in their potential yeah Karen. I had a student tell me in my first semester here that I was the first instructor he had had this fellow may have been about 50 that he had ever spoken with an instructor <coughs> And he just wanted to know why I was actually speaking with them. And I said, because I think it works better that way. Yeah. And he said, I just wondered why. I agree. He says, but nobody's ever taken the time to actually talk verbally with me. 
Interesting. And I thought that was sad. Great. Guys, I'm going to put the comments off there, but I really appreciate what you said. Uh, what I want to focus on today, go ahead. Um, the, the epiphany that I have, that I had the other day when I was studying all these things is numbers one and three, for me, are probably going to be accomplished through number two. So I shouldn't be asking myself necessarily, did I share testimony? Did I do this and that? I, I need to ask myself, did I think about my students? Did I build a relationship with them in a way that they could, that I could, was in a position to build faith in Christ? Did I build a relationship with them in a way that they were able to see that I love learning? That I'm a learner myself and I'm not perfect. Um, I, I, and those are the things that we want to kind of talk, talk about today. And I'm just going to keep stuttering all day until we start talking. Okay. Okay. okay, we found this quote in the, is article, article by Alan Wilkins? Yeah. Yeah. By um, a BYU student focus group researcher. So the researcher's doing his focus groups with all these students about uh, the student's perspective on teachers and how they felt that they connected with them and that kind of thing. So he found that how the teachers act and treat their students is more important than sharing a scripture or mentioning spiritual things. I find that so interesting because we think that that's what we're supposed to do. So your question, how do you build relationships with anyone? It doesn't have to be a student, it could be just people. Yes, I just try to be real. Like, you know, I tell them what's going on in my life, I mm -hmm. ask them what's going on in theirs, and I think those are, it's important to mention that this doesn't mean, vulnerability doesn't mean being walked over or not having strong boundaries. It's the exact opposite is true. It's saying, you know, this is, these are where my limits are, and as a teacher, those are like deadlines and you know, classroom behaviors, and so I think uh, all that goes hand in hand. Yeah. Anything else? How do you build relationships with people? <laughs> I think one of the biggest things is showing empathy, and I mean that in a, in a good and bad way, like empathy when they're sad, I think empathy when they're excited is important too. I'm so, I'm excited with you, and mm -hmm. I, I think that, I don't know, I think that's a big thing, is just kind of reflecting those emotions. Go here and then back. I was going to say empathy as well, because but but empathy different than saying, "Wow, that's really hard for you. I'm sorry you're struggling." <laughs> to being, I'm here to be with you, and this is how I've struggled, and this is how I made it through it. Um, being able to show the students places, and I learned I learned three that it's just terrible. But to say, "Here's here's your workaround. That's okay, right? It's, this yeah. is okay. We're all going to struggle, and it's all right." Yeah. I think if you're in a face-to-face -face environment, you ask questions and you listen. But it's harder to do that and get the listening component in when you are in an online setting. So one thing that I found um, that has helped me with developing relationships with my students is getting in there, finding those discussion boards, taking little tidbits that they're sharing and tracking that. And pretty soon you can start to remember, okay, yeah, I remember this intro post and I know kind of about the student's background. And now I've pieced together a few more parts of their lives. And then as you're responding and, and feedback and emails or whatever that may be, you can ask questions and you can stop and really listen and hear what they're saying and get more information from them. Because who wants to go hang out with a friend who only talks about themselves and, and isn't engaged and interested in their lives? And so I think as instructors, we really have the responsibility to work even harder to find those little pieces and pull that out and make our students realize that we care. Like we actually really are involved and we want to know what's going on. Yes, like, oh, there's two more. Okay, so here's the pink and then we're done. I had a student last semester who was really frustrated with um, with her study group. And <clears throat> last semester, not this semester, but last semester, students were randomly enrolled in a group. And this semester, they got to choose which <coughs> group they could, they could be enrolled in. But this student um, had, had not participated in study groups, so she wasn't earning any points. And I emailed her and said, I noticed that you haven't been participating in your study group. Is there something that I might help you with? Are you struggling with something? And then she sent an email back that just unloaded. This is the most ridiculous waste of time. I never benefit from these groups. They don't do anything that's helpful. I post, I try to share my contact. Nobody responds. Nobody responds. I shouldn't lose points because they don't respond to my efforts. So I thought very carefully before I responded and just express to her that I understand how challenging group work can be, and I understand how frustrating it can be when, when you're putting forth effort 
but nobody's responding, and that I was confident that if she continued to try to do her best, that she could she could take the lead and, and be a leader in her group and encourage and help her classmates. And then the next week, she posted, she took the study guide and said, hey you guys, these are the things I found for the study guide. Who's gonna answer the next question? And then they started responding. And so I sent her another email that said, I noticed that you took the initiative and the lead. Thank you so much for doing that. I am so proud of you. I know this is something that you didn't want to do and you did it and I'm so proud of you. And she said, wow, that means so much to me that you noticed and encouraged me. So I think that kind of interaction makes all the difference in the world. It's so important to acknowledge their feelings and not what they are either. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a teacher in my teaching group, and I won't name names because he's in this room. <laughs> and he's my very favorite. And one thing that I admire that he does, that I am not quite there and uh, ready to make myself do that, is he makes himself available to his students um, in all areas of communication. So <clears throat> I know it's not for everyone. I don't give my cell phone number to students unless. I need to, but he has that option for his students to, to text him or call him if they have a question, but <coughs> even more than that, he's responds to their emails promptly and he's available. And I think about my closest friends that I have, and that's what I admire, is one of the big qualities is that they're available for me if I need to talk to him or if I'm nervous <coughs> about something or something exciting happened. And the way he responds to his students isn't cold or quick. It's very engaged and then takes it a step further and often shares this testimony um, of the whatever is happening in their life or the struggle that they're having. And I really admire that. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. I wish we had time for more, but unfortunately we did not. So um, Alan Wilkins, during his research, came up with these top four ways that students say they feel the professor's love or concern from the professor. And you guys talked about a lot of these, actually, making themselves available, um, guiding them, remembering their name, learning their name and remembering it and using it. Everyone loves the sound of their own name. And then giving clear and constructive feedback. And I'm going to go out and add positive on that one. The positive feedback goes a really long way. Okay, let me tell you a story about myself as a child. I was... I grew up so much. Okay. As a child, I was painfully shy. Very, very shy. I did not know what to say to people. I didn't know how to act with people. My face would get bright red. I would be sweating. I felt like I was going to throw up. Um, and therefore, didn't have many friends. And just, just, I felt very awkward. I just didn't know what to do. Um, my dad recognized this. My dad's job is basically to meet new people all the time. So he helped me learn some skills to deal with that. He bought me books. We read them together. We read How to Win Friends and Influence People as a Teenager. We would have family on evenings on how to meet people. We would role play. Hi, I'm Kathleen. How are you? And then ask talking point questions, right? Practice over and over again. I mean, I never really got good at it. Um, until I was in college. And I had a few roommates that were very good at this, um, just meeting people they didn't know and talking to them, and they went on a lot more dates than I did. And so I was like, I need to learn, I really need to learn how to do this. That was my motivation, I guess, to go on more dates. And so I watched them and I copied them. And somewhere along the way, I kind of picked up some skills. It's not always comfortable, um, but the best thing about online teaching is that I get to practice this all the time. Every semester with new students, Every week, trying to reach out to people I don't know. Every year, here with you guys, who have maybe seen your name in writing, but haven't actually met you, we get to practice building relationships with people. And that translates really well to your students. OK. This is another story. I want to give you a very good example about how to build relationships with students from a teacher. I am <coughs> also an online business student. I am getting a second bachelor's degree in business management. This is my last semester. Hallelujah. Um, and this <coughs> semester, I have Mike Gregory as my teacher for B361. There's a lot of Excel spreadsheets and things like that. And last week, we had an extra credit assignment with a data analysis thing <coughs> in Excel. 
I could not get mine to work. I could do everything else right. I got 100 on the weekly exam. I got 100 on the homework, 100 on the chapter reading. I could not get the add-in for Excel to process correctly. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I followed the tutorial, like slowed it down, pause, side by side on a different computer, like exactly. And it, it would like zero out my spreadsheet and not work. I was very frustrated. I tried Dave's computer, a friend's computer, <coughs> Google spreadsheets instead of Excel, maybe that would work, none of it worked. So I took a screencast of it and I emailed it to him. Did I mention this was extra credit and I didn't actually have to do it? <laughs> I'm one of those students that are like, they miss one and they're like, why did I miss one? That's me. <laughs> so I emailed it to him and I'm like, I know I don't need it, but I'm, I've been working really hard on it. I know how to do the spreadsheet. I know how to do the math. And it's just like the program won't run right. I don't know what's going on. So what he did for me on Tuesday of this week, he emailed me back and set up a time for me to meet with him at Adobe Connect where I talked him through his computer. He recorded the whole thing to make sure I knew how to do it right and gave me extra credit. Did he have to do that? Absolutely not. Should I have just let it go? Probably. <laughs> um, this is so against everything I believe in. Um, that is the perfect example of like how to build a relationship with me, letting me know that I am important to him as a person, as an individual. I will say that as an online business student, I have had many, many business teachers who are very much like this. And the skill, I appreciate them, is, is their ability to build a relationship with me as a person, and I have met some of them at these conferences the last two years, which is really fun, and their ability to be vulnerable, show their mistakes that they've made in the past, and share them with their students. And be like, hey, you know, I made a bad choice here, but we learn from it and we move on. So one uh, quote, I was often been studying vulnerability for a while. I found this blog in Faculty Focus. This wasn't even anybody at BYUI. This is uh, Dr. Robert Dornsife of Creighton. He says, if I'm not willing to be vulnerable to my students, I am not able to teach them. Being vulnerable is the inevitable result of the trust we must have in our students as we expect to teach and learn from them and with them in every respect. And to me, that really summed up the learning model quite well. Our responsibility to be vulnerable in order to facilitate better teach one another. We puts us in that position of being a teacher, being a student, of being a lifelong learner. Go to the next one for you. Okay, so here's some of the vulnerability strategies we've been kind of experimenting with ourselves. Um, storytelling, obviously you can tell, my wife has been practicing her storytelling, she can tell lots and lots of great stories. Um, share your faults with your students, uh, how and why you need the atonement in your life. One really great uh, thing I wanted to share with you is, David Nielsen, who was our keynote speaker at lunch yesterday, gave a talk that I attended probably two or three years ago. And in that talk, he shared the church had just created a guidelines for communication. Um, and he shared a lot of great Mormon messages and things that were created based off that guide. And one of them was the Meet the Mormons video. And the essence of that guide, I don't have it with, you, with me, I wanted to share it, but as I asked him about it yesterday, he said, actually, we're rewriting it again right now, uh, and we're, being, we're backing it all with research. So it's not totally ready to be shared yet, but, um, the essence of it was, gone are the days of the 70s, 80s, and 90s when we all grew up and we saw in every church media what? It was like picture perfect, right? We saw like the picture perfect deacon in his shirt and tie sitting on the front <laughs> row. and um, They heard a lot. Uh, he shared with us that they heard a lot of feedback that I can't, I'm not good enough to be a Mormon. I, I'm not, I don't fit that mold, right? And so what they are trying to do, and I think you see this really well with Meet the Mormons, is they're trying to tell authentic stories of the human experience using the atonement to become Christ-like as much as possible. And so be willing to share some of your faults and how you need the atonement in your life. It opens up a great opportunity to share your testimony in unique ways. Be willing to share our families. This is one that my wife and I have done many, many times, no matter where we've lived, whether it was Dallas, Texas, or North Carolina. Um, the world is really interesting when they see a regular, you know, they see, I don't want to say a regular family, when they see a family, a working family, it catches them off guard. Um, 
And so media just paints such an opposite picture of what families are. Be willing to share your family uh, to a certain extent with, with your students in your classes. Um, avoid feeling sterile, fake, or polished. I really, really feel strongly about this uh, because it, it's obvious. Your students know right away when you know, if you're just saying what you need to say because that's what you're supposed to say, they can feel through it. Um, they can tell you on script. <laughs> one really great example I have is I, I was visiting a class a couple weeks ago and uh, there was a piece of feedback. And this student uh, turned in a budget assignment, right? And in their budget, they didn't have tithing on the budget, right? <gasps> and I don't know the full story, right? I don't know the full story, so I'm not making too many judgments here, but I am. Um, so I acknowledge there's a lot of other things happening. However, what you should know is that the teacher, upon not seeing the tithing in there, Instead of just you know maybe using it as a conversation, said I want to take this this moment to bear my testimony on tithing, and to me, my perspective was my reality. It felt forced, and it felt rote. It almost felt like I was, I'm, a, I'm obliged to share my testimony at this time, rather than saying, "Hey, I really hope that you consider putting tithing on here." My family, we find it really hard sometimes, but we've seen the blessings in our own life. Like just. It flows naturally. Because I didn't start off with saying I want to bear my testimony that I know the church is true, does it make it any less? No. I don't know. Uh, that's, that's for you guys to decide. Um, we, we just saw, think about President Hinckley. He was so good at just being natural. He, I mean, he spent his whole life working with the media trying to figure out how to do this well. Um, forget about what you're doing. Focus on your students and why you're saying what you're saying. Try not to make it, I have to do this, 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 and this. Let's do some examples. President yes. Gilbert does this really, really well. Okay, so do you have the time stamp? Yep. Okay. Do um, I have just a small clip to show you of this one. I thought I thought President Gilbert did a really good job of being like, this is who we are. So, you can do it too. Especially yesterday when he was like, oh, We do I don't know. But I'd argue. I, no better family is. Though. I'd argue. I think my mom would have the tougher job. The one thing I want everybody to know about our family is that we're just like everybody else. We're no different. We have the same trials and happy times and sad times and humbling moments and exciting things that everybody goes through. Oh, gross. Who are we, Semites? Me too. We love each other so much. But sometimes we have to turn the decibel level down a little bit, and sometimes we have to make sure people aren't yelling at each other. And we're not perfect. We have to clean up toys, and and um, and yet, like all families, uh, we're trying to be better all the time. The other thing I'd say about our family is we really do love to laugh and have fun. I love the Kevin Foreman shoe. <laughs> And um, what happened? I'm looking for it. Hit the present button. No, that one. I don't know how. Who knows technology around here? <laughs> 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 okay, next one. Um, Dave and I used this clip in a um, lesson we taught at Sunday school. Because it's so funny. As our sons were growing up. That's what you're doing. Don't go full screen. Okay. Listen to your wife, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to learn that lesson. Lesson of the day. As our sons were growing up, our family did what you have done and what you now do. We had regular family prayer, scripture study, and family home evening. Now, I am sure what I am about to describe has never occurred in your home, but it certainly did in ours. Sometimes, Sister Bednar and I wondered if our efforts to do these spiritually essential things were worthwhile. Now and then, verses of scripture were read amid outbursts, such as, He's touching me. <laughs> <laughs> Make 
Kim stop looking at me? <laughs> Mom, he's breathing my air. <laughs> it must have happened in your home if you're laughing. <laughs> Sincere prayers occasionally were interrupted with giggling and poking. And with active, rambunctious boys, family home evening lessons did not always produce high levels of edification. <laughs> At times, Sister Bednar and I were exasperated because the righteous habits we worked so hard to foster did not seem to yield immediately the spiritual results we wanted and expected. Okay, the next one is, okay, are there parts in your class that you teach and you're just like, I don't like this week, I don't like the topic, boring, no, just <laughs> um, this is a section, there. this is a section of my announcements for lesson three of GS120 slash GS120L. It is on note taking and disciple leadership. Now, I acknowledge that this week and I have a love-hate relationship, okay? The disciple leadership section is fantastic. However, on the other hand, the hate part, note taking. Not that I hate it, because I really truly only hate olives. <laughs> I don't like note taking, not because it's not good for you, because it is good for you, it's because I am not good at it. And I acknowledge that it is one of my flaws. And every semester when I teach this lesson, I feel myself lacking. So I have a hard time with it. It's something I need to work on. It doesn't always have to be a video or you and a screencast. It can be typing and acknowledging that something is boring or hard and that you're not good at it. And I feel like the students really appreciate that when you acknowledge that something is hard. But it's OK, because we're going to do it together. Uh can you guys think of any examples in the scriptures uh, of vulnerability? There's one book that I read the other day that really just jumped out at me. Um, I use uh, Ether 1227 in my writing class because he talks about how he's, <coughs> Mar Mar talks about he's not good at writing, you know? And I use that a lot in my class because my students feel really weak. But then I talk about how, you know, the Book of Mormon came about and it's changed the lives of millions of people through the writing that was in it. Yeah. I, I use another scripture in the same mm -hmm. book, but it's about where he's complaining, complaining about how they weren't writing very well in his name. His job very difficult, yeah. and and that's okay because we all we get the benefit of how he prepared and revised and edited to make okay. it work for his people who need it. Yeah. One thing that I thought of the other day, we were reading. Um, we were reading First Nephi because we were starting to look more. Not yeah. because we always read First Nephi. But I know First Nephi pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the whole session where <laughs> Lehi and his wife are murmuring, and I was, I asked my wife, like, why do you think that was included? Why do you think that the prophet, the, the prophet shared that his father, the prophet, was murmuring against the Lord for having the, commanded them to go back to Jerusalem? And I thought that was just a really great moment that he admitted that even the prophet has times where his faith falters. And uh, I just, anyway, I appreciate that one. Let me ask you this. Did you have a comment? Oh, I was just going to say the second Nephi chapter 4 is one of my favorite. The Psalm of Nephi. Yeah, um, it's also one of my favorite. It is one of my favorite. Um, I have a question. <coughs> so when we moved to Island Free a year ago, full rollout, did anyone say, Home office. <coughs> this is hard. Anyone saying this is hard? But we can do it. Yeah. Could you imagine the? I mean, how would you have felt? We were all struggling, right, at that time. Uh, how would you have felt if someone from the home office, like myself, or even somebody higher that has way more power than me or more authority than me, had said, "We know this feels like the wrong thing." Or we know this is really, really hard. Well, you guys didn't say the wrong thing, but you you did acknowledge it was yeah. hard. I, I mean, I just thought that how does that make you feel? Uh, well, I thought if these guys think this is complicated, I probably better pay attention to what they're saying <laughs> so that I can learn how to do it. Yeah. I, I like it when people acknowledge that things are hard. Yeah. 
that's how I choose my friends, actually. My <laughs> friends are like, being a mom is hard. And I'm like, we can be friends. <laughs> I feel, glad, I feel better that you, that you heard that because someone, someone in the midst or uh, the service satisfaction survey a couple months ago actually blamed me for picking out on three. I'm like, man, I must have done a pretty good job of making them think that I was supportive of other. <laughs> I don't know where I learned this, but when raising children, if you, a child is struggling with something and you're kind of dismissive, like, this is easy, you should get this, it shuts children down and they don't try hard. But when you acknowledge how difficult it is, whether or not you feel like it really is, then it makes them feel more motivated, and when they get it, they feel a sense of accomplishment. Yeah, that's great. We actually, oh, sorry. we're, we oh, we've got till we have 15 minutes. Well, I mean, I was just thinking about the I learned three whole thing. Yeah, thing, let's call it the I learned three thing. And initially, it was like, all I heard was, you know, don't complain, just, just you know, and <laughs> people, people were saying that, like, from, you know, like, But when you started like the memes, mm -hmm. it, it was almost like oh, it's okay to actually to laugh at ourselves. <laughs> like we can just laugh about this, even though half of it wasn't funny. But we can <laughs> laugh about it, and we can actually acknowledge, yeah, this is stinks. Well, if you don't laugh, you cry, right? Exactly. And so it was. It was the alternative, the better alternative. It, it, it was. It was a. It was actually a good thing. Lift it away. Uh, I was to say I, I have a, I'm retired from the military, so in, you know, in the undeployments, one of the sayings we always had was embrace the suck. <laughs> <laughs> just, I have just got to embrace it and and, uh, and go with it, and uh, and we develop that kind of morbid sense of humor because of it, like you know, doing memes and stuff. I really relate to that. So. Okay, we got two more examples that I really want to show. Um, Dave and I do our weekly announcements together sometimes. So this is one of the ones that we decided to do together um, a couple of months ago, last year, I don't remember. Um, it doesn't have to be polished and perfect, so here we Welcome to lesson three. <laughs> back to me and said how much, I had one student specific that said how much it meant to her what my wife said there at the end. Um, it was something that I didn't, I, I never really felt that, right? I've never been a stay-at-home mom who felt like her brain was mush coming back to school. But 
she has. And it's been a stumbling block for her sometimes. She's, it's totally not necessary. It's all in her head most of the time. She's very that smart. That is where the brain is. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have I ever told you how many silly things I say? <laughs> um, but it just really meant a lot to her because she said she felt that way the whole time. It was week three, right? She was still getting over that Four. hurdle. <laughs> I'm still making that mistake. I know. <laughs> but having that empathy, like just knowing that these are hard things. Try to figure out what your students are feeling. The other thing that I really loved about this video is you try to get a sense that Christine thinks about these students, thinks about the lesson, thinks about the talks that are in it, not just when we're studying for what we're going to say in our lesson notes. It's just something that we are thinking about because we're thinking about our students all the time. If you have those, you, have, they're not, you don't get those serendipitous moments, those immediate moments that you have when you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, so you have to almost be more uh, specific, more intentional about going out of your way to reach out to students and say, hey, I was thinking about you when, right? I was thinking about this the other day when I was walking you know, to work or whatever it might be. If you get your students to feel that you are actually thinking about them and thinking about this lesson content on more occasions than just when you log in, they, you connect with them. There are more <coughs> opportunities there to make those connections. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're just going to do Let's it, guys. Do, it. do you have to... Um, So there's one more example that we want to show up oh, here. Just a quick disclaimer. <laughs> I was wearing a seatbelt in that last video. I, I, had, I had pulled it under my arm so I could lean with my phone. Just take it on my phone. So, <laughs> so we're using a lot of video examples because video is really easy for us to see. We're all really visual. And Karen let me use this one. Uh, this was in the peer mentoring class that we had a couple months ago. And she was trying to drag home a point about we kind of need to get over ourselves a little bit. Just be willing to kind of put yourself out there. And she just had one of the best videos that I loved. And I wanted to share it real quick. Let's see if we can find it down here. Ha! I am taking Shelly up on this so it that you can see <laughs> video your, your own face is OK. I appreciate the fact that it's your own face. It's my own face. <coughs> and as you can tell, my own face doesn't have anything to hide. It's just there. <laughs> all of its imperfections. <laughs> so, uh, how do I start? All right. Step one. Comb the hair. <laughs> Fast forward here a little bit. All right, so then, uh, oh, the light's showing. Light, please. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, you don't like that one? No, no. This one, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> and it was just a great example. It's just sometimes, yet it's not about you. It's about letting your students connect to you, right? I, I have this theory, and I'm not sure how true this is. Um, there's, this is not backed up by any data in the slightest. Yes, it is. But I have this theory that the longer you spend editing and recording, if you do any of these videos, the less authentic it becomes. <laughs> okay? So don't be afraid. I mean, whenever we do our videos, it's like, we're going to do this in one take, period. We don't make any apologies. The only thing we edit for, because you saw some edits on ours, time. was we edited for time. But we didn't edit out the ums and ahs. We didn't edit out when I can't figure calling out. calling it lesson three, exactly. lesson four. <laughs> we try to leave in ourselves as much as possible. Have you guys but. ever done, like, when I was a newbie, I think I was in my first video, and I kept messing up, like, really bad and starting over. That was before I was using, like, the editing tools and different uh, ways of recording video that I'm using now. I think I was just using Jane. And I was like, I gotta redo it, I gotta redo it. And so I get on like take five, and I just felt very stiff, you know, and it was very much like this. She kisses my boo boos, she braids my hair, 
my mother is beyond compare. <laughs> you have kids, you know that's wrong. Right? You don't want to sound like a zombie. <laughs> and you can if you take a million really takes or have a script. What else do you have to go here? Yeah. Where is the movie? Can I say one thing while you're looking for it? Yes. Okay, I'll say it really fast. And so you guys actually taught me this because um, yeah. this name was my OCR for a while, and then I worked with Dave on some stuff, and you guys taught me how to do this. And when I first started trying this, it was scary because I felt like I was going to lose my professionalism, that my students wouldn't feel like I was an authority on the subject if I was vulnerable like that. You know, but, and so it was hard for me to let go of that that professional image that I was trying to portray that I actually know what I'm talking about. Right. And so I, I kind of have had to like reach a, a in between place where I, they still respect what I know, but I am vulnerable, and I, it's a better place to be. The thing that hit me is that our students sit behind the computer; they interface with the with the machine every day. Right? But the gospel is about human connections. The more and more I've progressed in my own testimony of the gospel, I've seen more and more that Christ works individually, one on one, as much as possible. And uh, if we can do this, I also would say it. Um, we, we've got to help our students get past that computer, to help them feel like they're not just talking to a computer. And you have to be intentional, because on online, it doesn't happen naturally. You have to create what they call an online persona. Be willing to share you, basically. Um, yeah, I'm still going to This was presented at the faculty conference on campus not too long ago. Um, this is an instructor who was sharing uh, an experience where he was using a PC and he started using a Mac. So he thought he was, his department decided to go to Mac. He was using a PC, so he was doing a PC really well. But he was doing it wrong because everybody else had moved. So he moved to, to Mac, and he said he had to have courage and vulnerability because he was in a vulnerable state. He was learning something new, something that he was not comfortable with, something he knew nothing about. It was like learning a foreign language. And he said that opened up the opportunity for growth. And that is something also that vulnerability does for us, is it puts us in the learner's shoes. And we do, when we do that, we're able to empathize better with them, we're able to connect better with them, and we can make those gospel, those personal gospel connections, even though it's online. Anything else that we forgot? All right. Last thing, just sum up. Storytelling, show your true self, be involved. What else? Show your face. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. We have um, a couple of tools, screencast matic Loom, Talk and Comment is a Chrome extension. Don't forget your phones. Don't forget text. Be willing to share things in text that can kind of expose yourself a little bit, at, just enough to help students feel you. Oh, yeah. quick comment. Did anyone not go to the storytelling or video? I think it's the video, how to watch, make a video that students will watch. Oh, was, you guys full. did awesome. not go? It was full. It was full? Oh, full. Okay, something we'll that- have the recording supposed to be. Yeah, they will. But something studies have shown that, I think they said in theirs, no longer than six minutes. Yeah. We try and do five. Five minutes, cut it off. Because they just, they just won't watch it anymore. And one last plea before we go. We're all switched, you guys heard that we're switching from Adobe Connect to Zoom. The difference with Zoom, is it's video first. And so when we meet in teaching groups, I like I think I've had a hard time connecting with my teaching groups in the past because we all get on Adobe Connect and what do we see? A screen. Not quite just the screen. Just the screen, if anything, right? Sometimes it's just a chat room. Uh, sometimes it might be our we're lucky if anybody gets on video. Zoom is video first. It's gonna turn on your webcam. And I'm just going to plead with you right now, be brave enough to turn on your webcam. There is nothing more impersonal than getting on there and just seeing the silhouette. How many of you guys have seen the Studio C where like Jason's trying to record his like voice message, right? And after like a hundred different voice messages, all he leaves is like the automated computer message, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he says, wow, how impersonal. <laughs> it's kind of that same idea. Try to be personal, try to expose yourself a little bit so that we can make better connections with each other face to face, even when we're meeting in our teaching groups online. And that's kind of our, our message is be natural, share your testimony, but build relationships of trust so that you are in a position <coughs> to 
build testimonies of the gospel of Jesus Christ, build disciple leaders. That's the spirit of Ricks. That's what brought us here. That's what brought us back. And uh, we should have the beginning of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.